Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you. My name is Jan Kranen, and I'm a director at the Research Center SAFE, Leibniz Institute here at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And I'm happy to welcome you to a policy webinar, uh, which runs under the title, A Game Changer for Europe's Capital Markets? Question mark. That's the question that we are posing basically after having um, received or read um, the new report that has been written by the High Level Forum on the Capital Market Union, um, which has been active for quite a while. And we will hear uh, about their work and about the results that they have been able to produce and that hopefully guide policy making as we go and as we move further. So people might think, Capital markets, oh, that's a topic that we haven't heard about for a while. We have so different problems now, problems that have to do with the real economy, with the, how to deal with the pandemic crisis, maybe, maybe with, with lending and fiscal programs and all that. So where does the capital market topic come in? Uh, why is it important to talk about it? And uh, I want to say that it's not only uh, that this report has been written and that is a, basically a date that makes it um, the right time to talk about it. But it's also that the relevance of having a capital market union is ever more um, apparent. And uh, if we think of the big uh, fiscal programs that are now being um, discussed nationally, but also at the European level, you wonder where all the funding for these programs might come from. And once you think about that, you will realize that there must be a capital market that can accommodate uh, these funding needs, that can manage it well. And uh, uh, so we need a good and developed and powerful capital market. And basically that's in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, short sentence, uh, the role of what um, um, the high level forum was supposed to study and to uh, give us clues about. So we have three speakers today. Two of them um, are members of the group. And the third speaker will be uh, the discussant in this, in this uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So we will hear relatively condensed statements by all three, which is Thomas Wiesa as the chairman of, uh, of the High Level Forum, Katja Langenbucher, a professor at Goethe University, who will, was a member of the group, and then Niev uh, Moloney from the London School of Economics uh, will be the discussant. I'll say a few more words about the three speakers, but that's basically the order of things. They will speak, and then we want to have a discussion, perhaps a bit among them, uh, but also uh, with you as the audience, and I want to point out that if you um, use your mouse and go on the screen, you will find at the bottom uh, at the possibility um, to pose questions. It's an F and A button. If you hit it, you will find um, the, a place where you can pose a question. And all questions that people are asking will show up on this panel. I can, everybody can see these questions. If you like a question, you can vote it. And the more votes it gets, the more higher it will be ranked in the presentation. And then I know where your interests are and want to take this question first. So that's how we will move. I will moderate the whole thing. And I'm very excited about the meeting. Let me say a few words about the speakers. Uh, Thomas Wieser, as I said, is the, the, the chairman of that high level forum. And for a good reason, because Thomas uh, was, I would say, a formative person uh, for many, many years uh, at the Eurogroup. So at the, basically at the, uh, at the representatives of the states in, in, the, in the European big game. Um, he was uh, leading the Eurogroup working group between 2012 and 2018, and may have been at that time, and maybe still is one of the best connected persons in, in, in Europe. So an ideal person who oversaw the agenda of the Eurogroup for so many years. And now he basically discusses and works on the agenda for the next years. And I think this is perfect, perfect fit. Um, he's a, an, an economist um, who has been working for um, the uh, 
finance ministry in Austria for, uh, for many years before going to the OECD and later to the European Union, uh, where after a short while he um, occupied the position that I just mentioned. And um, I'm very happy that he uh, is here today with us. Um, so as the chairman of the group, he can definitely say something about the whole structure of the, of the report. So he will be accompanied by Katja Langenbucher, who was a member uh, uh, or is a member of that um, high level forum as well. She's a professor of private law, corporate and banking law at Goethe University in Frankfurt. And she's also a professor affilié at Sciences Po in Paris. In a way, she's a, a bridge person between France and Germany. And we, I think we have recently seen that this is very helpful to have this bridge. And we hope that there is more of that bridge as we move, um, move on. Um, she has a very long uh, and uh, um, successful academic career on the topics that her chair is, uh, is mentioning, private law, corporate and banking law, and also a long list of uh, advisory roles in, in the banking process. Um, she has been a member of other high-level groups. She's also in the supervisory board of the German um, uh, Financial Services Authority and uh, and on and many other board positions that I will not mention now, but she has a lot of experience on all sides of the table uh, in that industry. And so I also look forward to her additions to the, start, the starting presentation by Thomas Wieser. And lastly, I want to mention um, Niev Moloney, professor uh, of law at the um, uh, London School of Economics. She's one of the, I would say the, the, the best known researchers and commentators on what's going on in European law. Um, she was the first to write a book about the regulatory process and the outcome in the um, in, in financial markets and securities market regulation here in, in, in Europe and has been publishing ever since uh, uh, important books uh, besides the articles that she wrote on uh, basically taking stock of the regulatory process in, in, in Europe. Uh, she's also um, uh, in, a, in, in, in key uh, board positions at, in Ireland, at the Bank of Ireland, uh, Central Bank of Ireland, and, um, and also at the um, European Supervisory Authority, uh, and also at the ESMA. So there are various institutional links um, uh, across, across the channel, since she sits in London now. And, uh, and, and, but uh, her, her intellectual capacity has been uh, used by her all the time to really oversee the regulatory, the regulatory process. Of course, it is very interesting to see how she, um, in a way, judges about the outcome of the report that we will hear about in a minute. So that, let me stop here uh, and I hand over to Thomas to introduce uh, the High Level Forums report. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, <coughs> Jan. Um, Normally, I would start uh, out with explaining why now, uh, but I think you've given a very, very good explanation uh, why capital market union uh, and invigorating capital markets uh, is now more important given COVID and the ecological transformation and not less. Other questions that people ask, this is not the first uh, report on capital market union, and that's putting it mildly. It's number X. Uh, and they say, is there anything new in there? Uh, why, why are you producing it? And uh, the, the answer is that we've seen very many, very, very good reports. And many of them uh, describe extremely well uh, where we want to be. Le moment venu. Um, and we're not shy of that. We also, want to, we, we also describe wh where we want to be. But as opposed to many other reports, we describe in minute detail of how to get there. So it's a map. And uh, if you bother to read beyond page 30, right up to page 130, you will see in granular detail, and for most uh, non-specialists, probably rather boring detail, exactly da, 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 da. this is exactly what you do, uh, directive by directive, uh, article by article, uh, in order to uh, reach uh, the state uh, that we aspire to. 
um, we have tried to be as holistic as possible. Um, we have not only looked at what very commonly is described, namely uh, the issue of uh, how to improve the raising of capital, i.e. the business environment, if you so want the supply side. Uh, we've looked quite intensively also uh, at the demand side, uh, at uh, fostering uh, retail. Uh, we have looked at the, the infrastructure that connect market participants and importantly, uh, we have looked at the cross-border uh, issues and especially, of course, the cross-border uh, barriers. Um, in, in so doing, uh, we've tried to, uh, if you want different categories of what we are proposing, you could look at it possibly this way. First, uh, simplifications where possible and given the complexity of the legal framework, there's more than enough of them. But also creating legal frameworks. There are quite a number of uh, areas, uh, especially in uh, more modern areas, if you so want, where there is a danger of 27 jurisdictions sort of drifting apart in slightly different directions. And this is now that we want to uh, have a unifying uh, legal framework uh, for them. We want to get rid of unintended consequences of previous legislation. Again, uh, there's more than enough out there. I will just mention uh, the area of securitization uh, for that. We have looked at uh, data, access to data, and made proposals uh, to reduce the cost of accessing data and enabling uh, the accessing of data and pooling it at the European level so that when you access it, hopefully free of, uh, free of charge, there is a huge pool of data available uh, to people, e.g. Uh, who want to be running due diligence. Uh, we uh, look at, uh, as I've already mentioned, lowering of investment uh, barriers and propelling uh, people towards the use of new technologies. So this, in a way, uh, if you want some uh, not macro but meso categorizations, uh, this is uh, what we, uh, how we have structured our thinking and have structured uh, our report. Just to give a small example, uh, at present, if you are a Slovak uh, entrepreneur in a high tech uh, uh, startup, it'll be very difficult to get an additional bank loan uh, because most of your collateral is up there. Uh, in your brain or in your uh, patent. Uh, you look for an investor in the small Slovak market, there ain't that many. Uh, what we are proposing is uh, to create a European single access point for company data, where in an increasingly harmonized way, this would flow together uh, so that uh, uh, people who want to run due diligence uh, can access it free of charge and the Slovak guy would be, uh, for example, finding a Finnish investor whom otherwise they would never uh, have met. So creating uh, a European framework uh, for such data and uh, the ability uh, to access it uh, free of charge. Uh, this is one of uh, the areas which are easy to do and uh, which I think uh, would by themselves already uh, be a game changer because you mentioned the question mark in the title of our seminar. Maybe to uh, uh, coming to a preliminary close, uh, where we all 24 uh, uh, colleagues uh, on the uh, uh, in, in this high level forum, plus my uh, three co sub chairs, uh, was everything uh, sort of Hunky dory, no great discussion, everybody in, in agreement. I think we had vigorous discussions over more than half a year, in the beginning physically, and uh, then uh, for a couple of months uh, by much more complicated uh, video mechanisms than Zoom. Um, but in the end, we agreed, we found an agreement and compromise on nearly everything, but not on everything. I just mentioned three issues. Uh, where there was 
no complete agreement, uh, and three, because they are in different categories. The one uh, is an issue beloved by some and derided by some others, consolidated tape. <clears throat> we simply could not be sure, is it as important uh, as uh, some people point out, or is it as unimportant as others would have it? So voila, uh, but the commission will be looking further at it. Uh, the most interesting uh, disagreement was on supervision. We had some people saying, it ain't broke, so don't fix it. Uh, we feel very, very comfortable with our national supervisor. He or she uh, uh, is the only one who really understands our business model and what it's all about. So let's not move to a European supervisor uh, who simply would be too far away and not close enough to us. Whereas others said, hold on, uh, we want uh, to prevent uh, uh, jurisdictional arbitrage, regulatory arbitrage, which you always invariably have as long as the legal framework is based on directives and not regulations, etc., uh, etc. Et I could go on for ages on that, I will not bore you, but just to signal uh, there were two very opposing uh, camps there. We have recommendations to uh, modernize uh, supervision at the European level somewhat, uh, but for quite a number of people, it would not go far enough. Jan, I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Thomas. Um, that was high level view on the high level forum report. <laughs> so we have now the big, the big issues and the big, um, um, also the areas where there, there might have been, and there certainly was discussion, you, you, you mentioned them, of course. I will not start now with a question. I hand over to Katja to give some more of the details that uh, you find particularly interesting. Please, Katja, go ahead. Yeah. So what I really like about the report that I think it's, it's succeeded in cleverly tackling some of the sort of hidden pockets of national discretion. And this is stuff which, uh, you know, often comes across as a harmless technical detail or an area of the law which really doesn't have much to do with capital markets. But a closer look then reveals that it's hugely important for how um, quickly and efficiently markets function. So the obvious example, and Thomas has already um, raised it, is legislating via directives. Of course, a directive requires each member state to transpose it into its law, and so we see a lot of tweaking uh, to make it fit. And that is useful in many situations, but as to financial markets, it's really not, and it deeply hurts legal security, it lowers standards, um, and it also hurts kind of the uniform expectation you want to have when trading across borders. So one to give you an example, one of the recommendations in the report is to go ahead with the shareholder rights regulation, not a directive. Because um, imagine, I mean, there's a current shareholder rights directive, the second one, and neither that one nor the first one um, have a unified definition of a shareholder, which comes across as somewhat surprising, right, given that um, at least looking at equity markets, knowing who a shareholder is across the European Union seems to be of prime importance. And, you know, there's more along those, those lines. We also recommended to align prerequisites, for example, for voting rights or for other corporate actions, um, which are of importance for investors on capital markets. And, and that highlights another pocket which might be less obvious, but has a huge national discretion, and that's corporate law. Now, corporate law, of course, comes across in very many shapes and forms um, across the member states. And we were looking at the US where there's a minimum of two differences if compared to European capital markets. The first is, of course, that the state of Delaware, where pretty much everybody is incorporated, um, acts as a de facto harmonizer of corporate law, even though corporate law is state law. Um, but also, and that is even more hidden, that the SEC has certain rights and kind of, you know, under the guise of regulating security markets, took over a couple of core corporate law questions, for example, on shareholder voting. 
And so we, you know, keeping that in mind, suggested to streamline those parts of corporate law, which we perceived as particularly relevant for the smooth uh, cross-border functioning of capital markets. And again, voting rights, um, intermediary, dividend rights, all those are, are examples for that. And still thinking along shareholder rights and voting and general assemblies, we did put a lot of faith into the promises of new digital technologies. So there's a couple of recommendations around both digital assets and also using digital technology um, to make it easier for shareholders and even retail shareholders, small shareholders. And, and to give you another example, there's, there's a pretty worrisome pocket of, of national discretion, um, which has to do with applying and enforcing regulations. You know, I told you already that directives are not such a great thing. So you would say, well, but if we have regulation, the problem is fixed. And still, it's not the case. There's a surprising lack of common interpretation and enforcement standards across the NCAs in the 27 member states. My uh, usual example is the market abuse regulation with its really broad and really unclear definition of what qualifies as inside information. Now you might say, well, whatever, then we'll just have a pretty complicated scheme of who violates insider trading rules. But the problem is much broader because this legal term also requires listed stock corporations to disclose what qualifies as inside information. Um, <clears throat> And so there's a lot of variety of how national financial authorities understand what qualifies as inside information and hence what they expect from their listed stock corporations to disclose to the market. And so one other recommendation we have is to get a clear ESMA mandate to define what qualifies as inside information, especially as to the so-called preliminary pieces of information, which is a huge you know, legal issue. Let's say the CEO steps down, for example, he starts talking to friends and people and board members. When is this inside information and when is it not? Um, and, and Prospectus is also a good example for that same problem. So the prospectus directive, you would think, well, we have passporting. So as soon as you're approved in one member state, that does the trick and you're able you know, to list wherever you want. However, we later you know, saw that it doesn't help as good as you would think, because even though you have the passport, um, crossing the border might still be very difficult because there's, for instance, different procedures for the approval of marketing documentation. So again, one of our recommendations says we need to streamline all of these approval processes to finally get that prospectus out quickly and, and efficiently. Um, but then, of course, Thomas has already addressed the, the sort of elephant in the room, um, which would do away with, I guess, most of those hidden pockets of national discretion, namely establishing a central European supervisor. And um, he's also <laughs> already told you quite a bit about how we couldn't really agree on um, what is a good uh, way forward, whether we should actually have that supervisor, that European SEC, or whether we'd rather stick to our national cultures and traditions and, you know, schmoozing with our supervisor. So I already see Neve. <laughs> Neve feels like it's her place <laughs> to step in now, so I hand over to you, Neve. <laughs> Oh, not at all, Katya. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. And, and, and thanks so much to Jan uh, for inviting me. And it's, it's such a huge honor, really, to be here with, with Katya and Thomas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a really important report. Uh, and I think it's great to have the opportunity to discuss it a bit with, with two architects of, of such a significant report. So, I mean, to go to Jan's question, you know, the game changer, um, I think it does two really important things. One, we shouldn't underestimate the political signaling function. You know, I think, yes, of course, that's obvious, but it actually really matters. Um, I think for the point Jan and, and, and Thomas have just been making, we need to keep people sort of focused on this when huge issues about fiscal support and bank capacity are taking up a lot of the, the political spectrum. But I think the second thing is, it's kind of going in the direction of what Katja has been saying, is it gets under the bonnet. I, I think that is a game changer. Maybe it doesn't sound dramatic, but tweaking under the bonnet of the legal engine that's supposed to support capital markets is really important and when i was thinking about this you know someone famously said about the banking sector um, the last great innovation was the atm right and since then you know 
And I think if you think about capital markets, the huge innovation was passporting and then possibly usage. And I think the report actually brings this out. So the job is to make sure they're working and clean out the processes of those really important innovations. And this report, it is incremental, it is pragmatic, and it is operational. And there are the three things, I think, to get this engine working. Um, so just a couple of comments. Um, first of all, um, around the retail markets, I think it's hugely welcome and important that the report has picked up on this. Um, you know, for years we've been saying we need a European equity culture, look at the US, we have to have this. Um, and one of the interesting things over the last few weeks was the really significant rise in retail investment accounts over the COVID crisis. Very striking. And ESMA reported on that. So we know the capital is there. We know it's building up in bank deposits accounts. We know it's there for intermediation. And we're beginning to see it come through to the retail accounts. But how, how do we do that sustainably? Um, it's incredibly hard. Uh, it's the incredibly hard work of inducements and conflicts of interest and supervision and, and, and keeping all this, uh, keeping the, the capital markets working properly. And I really appreciate that the report gets into that. You know, it talks about distribution, it talks about advice, and it talks about disclosure. And on distribution, it makes the argument for a cross-sectoral, consistent approach to inducements. And it does pick up this endless saga about how far we take the inducements prohibition. You know, should it move beyond independent investment advice and into other distribution modes? But what I really welcome is it's clearing through the sort of political national noise, if you like, on this. And it's calling on the commission to do an evidence based assessment. And that's really the only way we can figure this one out. So I think that, that's an important kind of structural point brought out by the report. It also calls for streamlined and better disclosure, which I think is always useful. I'm skeptical. I think there are such severe limits on retail disclosure that in a time of limited legislative uh, you know, capacity, um, yes, we can do stuff. But I think that the structural stuff is really what gets us there. Um, I also really welcome the focus on product governance. So kind of going to catch us a uh, point looking under the bonnet, they pick up on the European long term investment fund. Well, what is this? Right, it's a specialist alternative investment fund that provides the pathway through to the markets for retail investors to invest in unlisted security. So potentially hugely important for long term investment. But it tweaks that fund and shows how it can be improved and innovated and reformed to get retail investors access to those kinds of premiums, those risk premiums but also um, to move that capital over to the unlisted sector. I think we need more of that. I think we need more thinking about specially labeled funds that do certain things that sit within specific frameworks. Yes, we have uses, but uses is now a massive universe. And I really welcome that focus on the LTIF. Um, I'm a little bit more uh, wary of the focus on financial literacy and uh, consumer education. Absolutely, let's have it, let's have more of it. But it's sort of a 50, 60 year project, I think. Um, one thing we need to get better at is, is treating the retail markets a bit like an airplane crash where we need to, you know, really immediate, quick, specific consumer disclosures. So um, over the last few weeks, I've been looking at the websites of major European regulators and see if the increase in retail investment activity at a time of extreme market volatility is leading to communications around this. You know, what does volatility mean? When should you panic? You know, don't panic. Very little. You know, I think so, so we, we're not getting that sort of public um, advice function, which I think is really important, which the report brings out um, as well. Secondly, smart regulation. So Katya mentioned this really important recommendation picking up indeed on, on what, 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 what our, the commission has said, one in, one out. Let's stop thinking law fixes everything. One rule in, one rule out. But that presupposes we have the courage and the political um, will to acknowledge that's a bad rule, it has to come out. And I think the, the, the report is a superb job in, in, in operationalizing that. These are the rules that need to come out and need to be tweaked. Um, Finally, just a quick few points on the supervision side. And, you know, this may be controversial, but I don't think supervision is mission critical here. I think it sucks up a huge amount of political and policy energy for, for obvious reasons. It's, it's a really big question. But I think the great contribution of the report is it doesn't get sucked into this dominating the debate. It recognizes the contestation. 
Um, it also recognizes the importance of supervisory convergence. Um, and I, you know, I hesitate to mention the B word, but it does, it does point out that the capital market may get more polycentric and more fragmented after Brexit as business moves. And in that context, convergence would become absolutely critical in terms of dealing with transaction costs and, and arbitrage and so on. So I really welcome that operational focus on supervisory convergence, um, you know, empowering ESMA in different ways. I, I won't go into all the different ways, but empowering ESMA in different ways to, to deal with supervisory convergence. Um, one in particular, I very much like the proposal that ESMA would do regular reviews under key EU legislation, MIFID uses and so on, on where there are specific supervisory convergence issues at national level, and we do this very regularly. I think that's, that's super. One thing I would like is, we all kind of think we know supervisory convergence when we see it. You know, Katya mentioned, I think very eloquently, prospectus marketing um, processes and getting the prospectus out. But maybe we need to think about what is it? What is it exactly that we're trying to achieve? You know, it's not uniform supervisory practices, no, but it's trying to get rid of the frictions. So I think getting a very granular sense of what is it that ESMA is trying to unravel and untangle. And I think the report goes in that in that direction and that, that's hugely welcome. Um, another slightly technical point, but again, going to catch this issue by getting under that bonnet and fixing stuff. Um, I really applaud the, 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 the recommendation that ESMA can issue no action letters, these bind, this, this sort of binding device that you can suspend a piece of legislation uh, for whatever reason, um, but that it's done in a legally secure manner. It, it has an actual binding power to do so. Um, I think we need this, you know, if we're looking at rules that don't work or where we get under the bonnet and things kind of need fixing, uh, we need a mechanism to suspend and sort these things out quickly. So another example, over the last few weeks, ESMA has done a lot of work in the supervisory forbearance uh, area. Move that deadline, suspend that rule, given the COVID crisis. And to do so, it's worked, it's used all sorts of elegant soft law solutions. It's been pragmatic, but formally, this is in a very gray area. So I really welcome that, you know, specific, but nonetheless important, I think, recommendation. Um, I think there are some still issues here. I think we do need to get to the root of, if we're working off a supervisory convergence template, um, we need to somehow figure out the, the fact that ESMA's powers are all soft. We need to harden up some of these. And I think uh, here I, I welcome the, the recommendation of the group to have more independent members on ESMA's supervisory board, because that will give it, if not formal binding powers to get stuff done, it gives it a sort of an institutional heft, to, if necessary, to proceed against uh, national supervisors, but to really get into, into, into these frictions and these supervisory inconsistency issues. Um, so just to conclude, um, I think we need to be very careful in thinking about big bangs and grand designs. I mean, as Katya and Thomas have both said, we know where we need to go. We've known for a very long time. We've known since the Segre report, report back in 1966. Then we had the FSAP. Then we had Lanfalusi. Then we had De La Rosier. I think the huge contribution here is, is unpacking the pockets of difference. And I think recognizing you know, that there's limits to what law can do here. Here are the pockets we can untangle. And let's avoid creating new pockets. I think that's a very strong message from the report. It's let's keep this, let's move in a convergent direction, whether it's supervision, company law, or aspects of regulation. Um, and just my final sentence is, I think one of the issues in this area is capital markets union draws us in the direction of grand designs. I don't think that's what we're doing here. We're building market finance from the ground up. And that's a much more fundamental project. And I think what the report has done in getting at exactly what you need to do that is, is hugely welcome and much to be applauded. Thank you, Niamh. Thank you, Katya and uh, Thomas. Um, so if I, if I take it from where you left it, Niamh, you, you would be very satisfied with all the aspects of the report as nothing missing so to speak so this is now like a big menu that you put up to policymakers and um, so if i may may ask that uh, question from the sideline as an outsider to that debate is this um, is there enough prioritization do you need priorities in this menu or can you work basically in parallel incrementally on all these different um, uh, building blocks, so to speak, and will make some progress. So I think is this the, the, the list of issues 
uh, you mentioned some of them. Um, is that now defining a clear policy agenda? Will this be in a certain sense taken up or is it now lying around and will stay there as maybe was the fate of some other reports written in the past? Do you have a comment on, on that, uh, the doability, so to speak, the clearness of what should be done first, or is that all in parallel? So maybe I'll jump in just from the sidelines, Jan, and I, I know that Thomas and Katja will, will have a, obviously a very distinct and expert view. I think so, yes, actually. I, I think one of the, um, if you think, well, what's the most successful agenda the EU has ever put together in this area? It's the 1998 Financial Services Action Plan. 42 measures across all sorts of areas. So I think the EU has shown it can do that. Um, and I think the danger about saying, right, we're really going to focus on the retail markets or it's going to be the, the prospective side of it or whatever, it, you know, things get lost, it gets shuffled up in kind of parliamentary terms and other crises go somewhere else. And also we lose the sense that it's moving parts, you know. I think that the report brings this out very much. You're talking about an ecosystem of different pieces that work together. Quick example, right? Um, the, if we get the LTIF to work, um, that might feed into the investment product database. That might be supported by a, a cleaner way of thinking about inducements that you can buy these things execution only in, in a very you know, um, secure way. So I think, yeah, I, I, I think prioritization could in a way be somewhat troublesome because I kind of like the ecosystem side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can hand over the same question to Thomas and, and, and Katja. So is there any sense of priority in this list? Or is this uh, everything has to be done at the same time or it doesn't matter, the, the sequence doesn't matter and it's, uh, everything is just a work towards a better world? So well, speak. we had a lot of discussions actually about whether we should you know, have a pyramid, so to speak, with like the most important thing yeah. on top and then going down and down and down. Um, and there were, as always, a number of different views of to what extent that would be useful and to what extent it wouldn't. And you, you see in the report that we, um, in the end, not unanimously, but with a very good consensus settled on saying, this is not how we would like this to work. These uh, different recommendations are, as Thomas used to say, and it's true and it's a good picture. It's not a menu from which you can pick, right? They're, they're intertwined and they belong together. And it won't make sense to say, we start with one thing and the rest is gonna fall into place because this is unfortunately just not how the whole thing works, so to speak. It's too complicated to say we pick out one thing and then everybody, everybody's going to be happy and everything is going to work well. We have to look at all these, as I said, small pockets, which need to be cleared out and they need to kind of be brushed, you know, with the uh, household um, picture in mind. And that is what we believe will work. So I think prioritization in the narrow sense, as in saying we need this and then all the rest might follow, would, would be counterproductive. So, okay. So maybe Thomas, you can comment on this. I take this, uh, listening to what Katja said, it's almost like a hypothesis that we as economists like to think in theories and hypotheses. So the hypothesis that I take from what Katja said is these uh, different areas that you are covering they are in a way uh, complementary to each other. So you, you can move one thing at a time, but then you wouldn't move the whole grid, so to speak. But if you want to raise the level, let's say, of acceptance, of relevance of the capital market, you have to fulfill all these different uh, pockets or areas that, that you are mentioning. Is that, Thomas, would you share that? And in, in a way, um... Incidentally, it was apparently a Paul Volcker with, who loved the ATM and nothing that came thereafter. Um, I think if you, if you look at our report, we don't pretend uh, that there was a cognitive enlightenment there uh, and uh, that we're out there uh, in, in, in order to get famous for having discovered uh, the missing link. Uh, and uh, you go like, boom, like this, and everything will be different. Um, there is, it is quite clear uh, that if you hand this menu uh, to, to uh, politics, they say, we love these three and uh, abhor the other 14, then nothing is gonna happen uh, because uh, these things all hang together in a way. And uh, you can boost supply whatever you want. If there's no uh, boost in demand, uh, 
where does it go? And vice versa. Uh, if you do uh, very much in order to boost uh, national capital markets, uh, but the barriers between the national capital markets stay as they are, where does that leave you? So I would say uh, it is uh, a strong menu uh, where you need the large stomach and uh, more or less uh, should be consuming everything. Uh, one or two will fall by the wayside. I, I have no doubts about that. The procedure will be, as I mentioned, that the commission, the commission commissioned this report, I guess that's why they're called the commission, um, will be putting this into their work program in Q4 and subsequently uh, things will uh, be moving forward and we will be seeing legislative proposals. Are we sure that all 17 will pop up? No, uh, but I think a very fair share uh, will pop up. As a rule, the commission makes pretty good suggestions, legislative proposals. Then it goes into the political machinery. Uh, first, uh, it's, the, the, the first danger is, of course, that you've got 27 different national preoccupations. And so far, the 27 national preoccupations have been more uh, to retain present segmentation, uh, given that many of the people involved lack the many poly year uh, perspective of how much better it would be to have a unified capital market. And then from the council, it goes into the European Parliament, where of course you have uh, different ideological, national, and uh, other influences to put it, to put it that way. And uh, take, the, take securitization as an example, where uh, the previous proposal by the commission uh, is judged by outside observers as having been fairly okay. Not super, but fairly okay. Then it went into legislative machinery and that ensured that the thing simply didn't work. Didn't work, doesn't work, will not work. And that is why, that is the political component of what we are producing. We need to persuade politics uh, that what we are writing down, what we are saying is uh, a, we, sh we show a way of where ideally it should be moving with the hope uh, that politics and sectoral interests uh, do not uh, move the ship too far in the one direction and the other direction. So I think that will be, that will be the big challenge, first for the German presidency and then for the subsequent presidency, trying uh, to make things work uh, and uh, not just overload the Christmas tree. It's not a Christmas tree. It's a very simple menu, um, and I'm not pretending that this is the only way uh, that, that things will get better, uh, but uh, I think it, 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 uh, it, it's, it, it shows uh, that there is, amongst experts, a fair degree of uh, consensus what is desirable and what not. Let me just uh, add a footnote, because I've been looking at the Q&A and uh, there was one question, what the third issue of disagreement was, and that was uh, the exchange of views, of widely differing views between exchanges and investment banks on dark and lit. And so we had the consolidated tapers, we simply weren't sure, is it important or is it not? And uh, we had a very different views on supervision, uh, on architecture. Then you had very different industry, within industry views uh, of uh, regulation, how, how, how do we deal with uh, uh, dark pools? Uh, and there was no way uh, that we could come up uh, with a proposal uh, that could bridge this divide, which is very understandable. So we simply preferred to say, uh, uh, we prefer to uh, stay non-committal. That was the third. I'll, I'll let you deal with the other questions, uh, Jan, that, uh, that have been popping up. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I will, I will turn to the questions that have been raised in the, in the Q&A, but that was the one that I just wanted to bring in anyway. What is your third point? And I want to point out that these three points that you mentioned, the consolidated tape, the supervision side, and the dark and lit 
organizational side of exchanges are of course of particular importance in what you said because they are basically um, uh, circling the area where there was no disagreement while the report has been written on the idea where do we have a consensus and that's what the suggestions that, that are coming up with so um, uh, that is a particular way forward in the in the whole group work that you have all the members all the different constituents basically of the market industry at the table and then try to find the consensus very european i would i would say if i remember today's comment in the ft on what may be a problem in europe but <laughs> so let me um uh, go to the questions that uh, people have raised so there are, there are various questions that really deal with the let's assume that the process would be successful and the capital market get gains in importance which is hopefully the outcome of this study uh, the one question is uh, who who is really the beneficiary of a stronger capital market in in europe and that question is posed uh, region wise can you have do you have any idea about that i know it's not content of your study but maybe given you have thought about it so long you can say a few words about that and and secondly in a, in a different in, in a similar vein what what happens to other market participants if we have a stronger capital market doesn't this mean the banking industry will suffer so what are so to speak the distributional consequences of of this, are they in some sense related even to what you are you are suggesting and, and, and proposing? I don't know to whom I want to, uh, whether it's Thomas or Katja, but maybe I start with Thomas and you hand it over to Katja. You know better your distribution of labor. Okay, thank you. Well, on on the regional or national uh, consequences, uh, firstly, uh, one has to remember that if we were to link present national capital markets, that wouldn't get us very far. Uh, so it is an element of boosting national capital markets and reducing the barriers between individual national uh, markets. So as a rule, I would say the smaller the market, uh, the larger uh, the benefit, by and large. Uh, secondly, uh, the more uh, problematic national barriers to development of a national capital market are uh, the more that country would uh, profit. Take uh, insolvency legislation uh, where uh, the Dutch insolvency uh, process and uh, legislation works very well uh, and the average length of procedures uh, in a certain southern member states is four times as long as in, in, in the Netherlands. So, voila, if you want to access uh, your collateral and it takes you two years, where do you invest? You invest in the Netherlands and not in the other country, uh, where it takes eight years on average. So, that in itself, of course, shows uh, that bringing significant improvements to insolvency law and insolvency procedure won't do very much for the Netherlands, but will do a huge amount uh, for many uh, or some certain uh, other countries. So it's difficult to say, uh, to pinpoint uh, who would be profiting, but I think a certain algorithm, uh, the smaller, the better, and the higher the present barriers, uh, the better uh, it would be, which still doesn't say extremely much about the distribution of where then uh, uh, firms uh, would be locating, what the ownership would be. And that uh, I, I felt uh, very starkly uh, when we had these discussions between the large exchanges and the small regional exchanges who were afraid that if there is a unified supervision, uh, totally erroneous concern, I think, uh, that the smaller exchanges would disappear and everything would move to Frankfurt and Euronext and, and so on. So what I believe uh, would be a much, much better idea uh, would be an industry-led uh, consolidation of exchanges in Europe uh, and it is undisputable that a certain regional presence and know-how and antennae uh, are of the essence. But just re retaining segmented markets and barriers is not the way uh, to uh, retain a, a vibrant or create a vibrant uh, national ecosystem. So that's how I would uh, give a, a shortish uh, answer uh, uh, on, on this issue. Maybe turning to Katya to uh, 
pick up from there. I don't know whether I have, you know, a lot to add on this particular questions. I might have moved the focus a little towards uh, not which countries will profit, but which parties, so to speak, will profit, right? And um, But then again, the answer is similar to what you said. It very much depends on what you're looking at. So we, we hope that all parties will profit. We had a, a special focus on SMEs and, you know, we, we were trying to figure out where the problem is, what hurts most which is, for example, costs of listing, thinking back to the, the prospectus regulation, um, also uh, follow-up costs, also post-trading, et cetera. So we do hope that SMEs across the union will, um, will profit much. And I agree with Thomas that it's, it's particularly going to be the little ones, we hope, the smaller countries. Because if you have, you know, again, a, a story, so to speak, but if you're the little startup somewhere in a smaller country and have a great idea and you just need money, it's going to be so much easier using technology to the extent this will be um, an option in the future, hopefully, to access the entire market rather than need to go to that one more or less small stock exchange, which is not well enough connected to lead you to where you could be and where you should be. And then these people end up in Silicon Valley, which is a pity for all of us, obviously. So uh, we, we do hope, you know, to, to um, have profits in different shapes and forms for all the market players. Retail investors, of course, are the next um, players we had in mind. And there's a lot, as Neve already pointed out, there's a lot um, trying to encourage retail investors. Again, I always give this example from teaching you as students, and they know stock markets in and out because they are exposed to that. It's much less so <laughs> in France as well as in Germany, right? So retail investors is the next focus group, which we hope will profit. But I won't, I won't drone on, you know, given the, the limited amount of time and the large number of questions. If, if I just can step in here. So I was wondering, what is the importance that you give to investor protection? And in a, in a certain sense, this is the overarching main objective in the successful US system. They, they are not so much thinking about what you have just been mentioning. How do we, how can companies access, what is the primary market role, but it's really the secondary market that gets all the attention. And at least uh, without having studied the legal details of the setup, my perception of the American market, it's, it's investor protection is everything, right? And fr from that, everything else is derived. And I wonder whether, in, if you think about your own work in this process, if you would be asked to provide a formulation for the mandate of a non-existing European supervisor, uh, uh, let's assume that one day we have something like that, uh, what would be the mandate that comes out of your report? Maybe, maybe I ask Katja because it's immediately now the question, then maybe Thomas. And, and then I would also like to hear Niev's uh, comment after observing the literature and everything on, for so long on this issue. So, so just very quick comment. Uh, I don't even know whether U.S. law is, is so big on um, consumer protection. And they, they're getting there, or we're getting there rather, towards the Obama administration when they set up a specific um, agency dealing with investor protection, namely the, the CFTC. Uh, but there's, there's just been a Supreme Court decision uh, in the U.S. saying that uh, the whole setup is questionable um, under constitutional law and the firing of pres by President Trump of the boss of this specific agency um, was, you know, okayed by the Supreme Court. So I think we, we have chances of making things better. And for me, the main idea for, for and you know, the, the agency you envision would be independence. It would be its own agency. It can't respond to legislation in, in, the, in the sense that it can't be a part of a legislative body. It can't be part of a ministry. Um, it, it should be well-governed, um, as Neve said also, with independent members. And we have in the report a little bit about governance, uh, highlighting that it might be a mix of supervisory structures and more executive structures. So that is the direction towards which I would point. Yeah. Anything to add, Thomas, from your side? I, if not, I hand over to you. I'm, I'm, I'm more curious what Nymph would say. Okay, great. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> Nymph. Oh, it's such a great question. So, I mean, 
It's funny in a way, isn't it? Um, I think we look to the US as the paradigm example of household engagement with the markets. But in the US, as, as, as Katya said, it's equity engagement. It's equity markets. It's, it, it's equity in their pension funds. You know, that's what drives it. Um, and a ruthless enforcement, enforcement uh, focus. The SEC is an enforcement agency. That's what it does. Um, whereas you look, if you look to Europe, we don't have an equity culture, but what we do have is a really growing product culture, you know, um, all kinds of insurance based investment products, all sorts of complicated usage and all the rest of it. So, so that, that's sort of where we're coming from. So I think to go to your point, Jan, what does investor, you know, how does the investor protection fit there? It is a ruthless focus on conflict of interest structures, how they're put together, how those things are distributed. Um, so I think that'd be my sense of, where does investor protection feed into this? It's, it's that. It's designing and distributing products because I think that's where the EU is and it's going to be, we might get to an equity culture, but I think if we can get to a market culture, that's kind of the, the, the pre-staging post. And I, I think I completely agree, agree with Katya, that sense of an independent agency that enforces, right? I mean, that they, you know, really takes this stuff seriously. And, and again, you know, th that will be a very big change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that that's something I think we all agree on <laughs> that this is a one way. The po point is how how can we make that happen? I would have one other question to you, Nev, because also taking up a question that comes that's in the in the Q and A session here. Um, you you were talking about the the role of of ESMA also, and um, the question is how strong um, should can ESMA be as a, as a substitute for a supervisory agency, given that it is basically a club where everybody who is a member is uh, in, in it uh, and the members are basically representatives of, of countries and the supervisory systems there. So is this very similar to what you would think would be the efficient outcome for running or ruling or governing or enforcing things? Or is it... Uh, or would you see this more critical? I, I, and the author, maybe I could say that in the question been raised that in an earlier publication of yours, you, you actually said that this is a very nice construction, the, the, the clubbish thing, but today you were a bit more critical in that. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I think it goes, yeah, it goes to the heart of this evolutionary dynamic in European capital markets. So, you know, I think about 10, 12 years ago, markets that are quite, immature is the wrong word, but, you know, they're developing, regulations developing, um, the more peer supportive dynamic kind of makes sense, you know, we're learning best practice, we're trying to get everybody used to a single rule book, used to the concept of supervisory convergence. But I think as, as we're kind of moving into this second stage where we're getting onto the bonnet, we're fixing stuff, we're identifying the real knots that need to be untangled where it's getting hard, you know, where there's actual differences that need to be sorted out to fix. I think we're going to need more of the executive input. Now, I don't think you throw out the, the consensus building. I don't think you can, unless you have a single supervisor, you know, it's binary. You either have a single supervisor or you don't. Now, if you don't, you have to figure out a way to get the 27 working together, right? So that has to be part of it, you know. Um, but I think it, it's layering onto that, that independent executive presence. And, you know, as has been well discussed, that becomes critically important where you're proceeding against supervisors. I mean, I think, you know, you have to have the independent presence for that. Mm -hmm. So, I, and, and that is something that ESMA cannot provide, right? Or, or... Oh, no, yeah, no. yeah. And that's why I think the, 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 um, the, the, the point the report makes about, you know, they're not coming up with something turning the house upside down. They're saying something quite sensible and practical. Let's have independent members on the, supervi uh, on the board of supervisors. You know, and that's incremental. Let's see where we are in five years' time. Let's see where we are in eight years' time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that would be reforming ESMA in the direction of an independent agency, right? That would, that's a question whether that's feasible, but that's another, another question. Yeah, very good. So on this, there's a, I mean, we, we are basically running out of time. So um, my, my last invitation would be to Thomas and, and, uh, and Katja to uh, come up with... Um, with an, uh, a recommendation to the readers of your of your report, right? So think of the readers being um, policymakers, uh, well-meaning policymakers who say we want to advance things. And uh, what is the main the main message that youth would read into your report that they should walk away with? 
I mean, you said everything is important. Everything has to be done. Okay. But usually people start somewhere, right? And so where, where should they start? Maybe Thomas, you want to? I'll leave it to Thomas. Okay. And I'll just okay. give a very quick one because my, my one is, is pretty clear. It's raise awareness. Like get, you know, get the feeling that this really needs to happen now. And then you start with all the 17 recommendations. Okay. <laughs> very, very uh, diplomatic. And Thomas? Or Sibyllini. Um, yeah, it's a pity we're running out of time because there are quite a couple of good uh, questions there in the, that, that I've seen on the screen. Um, but I mean, basically, my, my message uh, to finance ministers uh, and their deputies would be and will be, uh, if you think that things are working quite okay uh, nationally, you will have a tendency just to leave everything as it is. But you have to realize that if you leave everything as it is, it will just stay a static and undynamic and un-European uh, with all the barriers uh, that are there. And that is not only addressed at Germany, which has a fairly small capital market, but it thinks it's a big capital market. Um, ask, ask the Brits. Eh? Um, but if the German capital market is not so large, uh, what are we talking about with the Baltic Stock Exchange uh, or the Czech uh, uh, or the v Vienna uh, Stock Exchange, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they want, to re they want to stay where they are and what they are and how they are, which is fine at present. But that's not going to solve the problems of the next 10, 20, 30 years. So think a bit out of the box. If it ain't broke, you still might want to make it better. You don't need to fix it, but you might want to make it better. And better means growing yourself and bringing this grown kid then into the kindergarten with all the other 26 kids and they will mature and things will be better. They won't immediately win the Nobel Prize. It's a long haul, uh, but they, they will progress. They will progress. Yeah, thank you. This, this is a... This is, I would say, uh, a final remark that, that for me, uh, that I'm listening to, it sounds like there is an evolutionary process that will lead us to a better financial system where markets may be more important, but it all grows slowly over time. And we are basically on the, on the right route, right? That's how I, how I, uh, how I read your, your comment. And uh, I, I leave it at that. This is a starting a new round of discussions if we would really discuss is is without a disruptive process it possible to have a larger capital market in europe because we have this substitution uh, with the banking system so that is a nice interplay um, i want to point out that there would be very high uh, emotional current topics that we didn't touch on today right so there are certain crises on markets relating to information uh, that we also could have discussed, but even in the questions, there's only Klaus Hopp who raised that issue. And I know that I now jump over it. We don't touch it now because time is out. I want to thank you for a very, very nice presentation, interesting discussion, uh, Thomas, Katja, and, and Niev, and uh, the audience for being patient with us. Thank you for your questions, and I wish you all a good evening.